Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We would like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Data Diversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Seiner. Today, Bob will discuss Build an Effective Data Governance, sponsored today by Irwin. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And for questions, we will be be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag RWDG. And if you'd like to engage more with Bob and continue the conversations with each other after the webinar, you can go to Dataversity Community at community.dataversity.net. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to a moment for, to Danny Sandwell for a word from our sponsor. Danny, hello and welcome. Hey, Shannon. Thanks so much, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, it is absolutely our pleasure to, uh, to sponsor another webcast by uh, Bob, and I think that the, uh, the topic, as always, is very pertinent. We're really seeing people making uh, great strides um, in the data governance uh, space, and, and I think that the topic is, is very timely because people are now looking not how to get convince, convince their organization to get it done, but now they want to know how do we get it done, what do we need to put in place, and, and, and what are all the, uh, the interactions and interconnectivity between the, all the moving parts that data governance represents. So uh, without taking too much time away from that, I'm just going to give you a quick view into uh, Irwin, uh, and, and in case you're not uh, familiar with us, uh, we were founded in March 2016. Uh, we were divested by CA Technologies, the uh, long-standing and industry-leading Irwin data modeler uh, product, and we've turned that into a data governance company. Uh, with a real focus on helping organizations get their arms around their data in every which way that they can so that they can get uh, the most value out of it, reduce the risk, and, and make sure that, that, that they can leverage that data for all of the things that they would like uh, to do uh, moving forward. So when you look at what organizations are trying to do, uh, we've really set our sights firmly on that, which is, is to take data-driven uh, insights, mitigate the risks associated with leveraging that data, uh, and then allowing organizations to practice agile innovation based on what those insights are telling them and really transform their business to meet the challenges of today, tomorrow, uh, and, and the day after that, because really it needs to be a sustainable practice over time uh, that allows you to, to meet today's challenges, but then there'll be new ones tomorrow and <laughs> even newer ones after that. And when we look at that, it's really about solving the enterprise uh, data dilemma. That's, that's really where we've put our focus, uh, which is really getting your data into shape to be able to leverage it in the way that you want to. Uh, starting with harvesting all of the data and understanding that data, you know, and, and collecting that and cataloging it, uh, organizing it in a way that makes sense so that you can understand all of the relationships and associations between the different aspects of your data architecture, your governance framework, and, and all of those other things. Uh, contextualize that data so that people can uh, you know, go at it from a business perspective and to be able to see all of the, 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 the important information around that data that will help them understand if it's the right data for them, if it's fit for use for the purpose that they're trying to, to use that, and then how to use it, and then how to access it to get that. And, and that comes with the next step, which is really administering the data, and I think that's a lot of what we're going to look at today, uh, so that you can develop uh, you know, governance frameworks and models uh, that allow you to, uh, in an agile and non-intrusive way, uh, manage that and make sure that everybody's aware of how that data, uh, you know, relates to the business, how it should be used and how it shouldn't be used. Uh, and then finally, making sure that everybody has access to that in their own perspective uh, in a self-service way so that they can really get to the value of that data without having to wait for uh, a lot of other people to intervene to make that a reality. And to do that, we put together a set of, of uh, capabilities that we've broken down into some, uh, into some suites, if you will. Uh, it all starts with us on the uh, enterprise modeling side. So 
getting hold of your architecture and being able to understand your business and the technology that supports it, understanding the business processes that you have and how you do business and how you might want to do business in the future and really be able to communicate that and collaborate around that and, and all come to a common understanding. And of course, Erwin Data Modeler allowing you to start taking all of your enterprise data and organizing it in, in schemas and architectures that are going to allow you to satisfy your business use case and meet your business needs. And then from there, building a foundation starting with uh, the, the data catalog where we will capture and manage uh, all of your metadata, allow you to, to really start to connect that and move, you know, move it around using the mapping manager all under lifecycle control with great visibility and capability to understand the quality of that data and then build on top of that our literacy suite, uh, which allows you to, to then start putting those business aspects on, uh, the stewardship tools, whether it's the glossary and the terminology, your business policies, your business rules, uh, and then opening that up through a self-service portal that allows people to uh, easily search, discover what they have, uh, visualize things like lineage, uh, understand the impact analysis, and really understand in you know, a one-stop shopping way all the aspects of the data and all of the, the particular characteristics of that data that will allow them to be successful using that. And, and we make all of that happen uh, using a lot of automation uh, in the platform as well as externally going out and allowing you to uh, automate the harvesting of your metadata, the cataloging and discovery and, and categorization of your data, as well as leveraging that so that you can activate your metadata through our smart data connectors to start driving out uh, new data management infrastructure uh, based on, on the metadata that you have in that catalog. And all of those things come together to really give you the data intelligence that you need uh, to really start to effectively practice governance uh, to implement the frameworks that, that uh, you know, Bob's going to talk about today. So that's really our goal in life, and that's what we have on offer. So if, you, if you're looking for technology to start helping you push these things in place, whether it's starting out at the modeling uh, level and really driving and understanding how governance needs to fit into your organization, what framework makes the most sense, um, and then, and then, you know, then pushing that all out once you have these things in place and, and allowing all of your stakeholders to understand what it is that you have in place. And that's what we call the Irwin Edge or Enterprise Data Governance Experience Platform, uh, really allowing you to manage your data assets and architecture, the processes, as well as the infrastructure underneath and govern all of those things to, to maximum business advantage. Net-net, at the end of the day, our goal is to get every stakeholder on the same page and enable them to do what they need to do with data uh, for the betterment of the business and to drive the key initiatives and that transformation that everybody is, is seeking and, and really uh, needs as we move forward in this, in this fast and uh, exciting business environment in which we live. So with that, Shannon, I think I will pass it back to you and we can get to the real topic at hand. Um, looking forward to it. <laughs> Danny, thank you so much. And if you have questions for Danny, he will be joining us in the Q&A section at the end of the presentation today. So let me uh, introduce our regular speaker for this series, Bob Siner. Bob is the President and Principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the TDAN Administrative Newsletter, tdan.com. Bob has been the recipient of the DAMA Professional Award for Significant and Demonstrable Contributions to the Data Management Industry. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I will turn the webinar over to Bob to get uh, today's presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Hi, everybody. Thanks for attending the session today. I know you've got a lot, everybody's got a lot to do, and I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to listen to the webinar. I also want to thank Danny Sandwell from Irwin. Um, always great to have them as a sponsor. And there's a lot of things that Danny talked about in the platform, in the Edge platform that he talked about that really relate well to the things that I'm going to talk about today. There's a lot of different components. And you know, as Danny had mentioned, you know, getting people to understand the processes and the roles and the communications and the tools that we can use to be successful in governing our, our data is so important. And it's, it's really important to collect that information somewhere and to, um, to have a metadata repository or a metadata base 
for collecting that information. So I'm always glad to have uh, have Erwin on board to work with us today. Uh, before we jump into my sharing with you a, a, an updated version of the framework that I presented a couple of years ago, I wanted to walk through a few things that you might want to know about. As you already know about the Real World Data Governance webinar series, next month's topic will be applying governance to business processes. So that's a question that I get all the time is once we've defined the roles and responsibilities and once we've defined the processes, how do we get the people actively engaged in these processes? I talk a lot about non-invasive data governance. So there's information about the, the non-invasive data governance book. I'll be speaking at three data diversity events uh, in the balance of the year. I'll be speaking at DGIQ, Data Governance Information Quality, in a couple of weeks, um, Data Architecture Summit in Chicago, and the new event, the Data Governance Vision event in Washington, D.C., later this year in December. Also, there's two online learning plans available through Dataversity, one on non-invasive data governance and one on non-invasive metadata governance. So that's the newer one, so please take a look at that if you have uh, have interest. Um, Shannon mentioned the Data Administration Newsletter. It's an online publication. It's been around since 1997. Lots of information uh, about the data, the data for data practitioners and people that are working in the data space. And last but not least, KIK Consulting. KIK stands for Knowledge is King. The focus of the, uh, the data governance uh, practice is on non-invasive data governance and uh, also now on non-invasive metadata governance. So that's a little bit about me to get started. I wanted to share with you kind of the, the, a list of the things that I'm going to talk about in the time that we have today. I'm going to share with you what I consider to be a customizable data governance framework. And you may have seen other frameworks that are something similar to it. I'm going to provide to you an empty version of it and also a filled in version of it. The filled in version is going to be most specifically towards non-invasive data governance, but the framework itself can be used or really any approach that you're looking at. And I'll get into that real quickly here in a minute. Um, I'll be talking about six core components of a successful data governance program. And these are the six core components of the framework. And if you see, I have the, the letters, uh, the word six highlighted in red. That's because before it was five. And I've added a core component. And you can guess which one that is. And we'll be showing that to you in a minute. We're going to look at those five core components from five different perspectives or different levels of the organization. I'm going to provide to you a detailed description of everything that exists in the framework I'm going to share. And then we'll talk about using the framework to help you to identify what's the most appropriate approach for you to use for data governance within your organization. I'd like to get started by sharing my definitions of data governance. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but at least we need to start off on the same page. And so I word my definition of data governance quite strongly. I say that data governance is the execution and enforcement of authority over the management of data and data-related resources. The fact is that however you define it, if you define it as being the cooperation or the uh, the bringing together of IT and business and, and process and things like that, at the end of the day, we need to make certain that we can make good decisions with our data and that we're doing the right thing. So I like to word my definition of data governance strongly. It's the execution and enforcement of authority. And when I talk about stewards, typically I talk about the fact that potentially everybody in the organization can be a data steward. If they have a relationship to the data and if they're being held formally accountable for that relationship, then potentially they might be a data steward and we might want to help them to understand how to make their life more efficient, more effective, and formalizing some of their accountability around the data that they define, produce, and use. And since I talk about non-invasive data governance, really non-invasive really describes the, the way that governance is applied to the organization. So we're not going to rewrite all of our policies. We're not going to rewrite all of our processes. What we're going to do is we're going to apply governance to these things and hopefully be somewhat transparent, supportive, and collaborative in our approach. The idea is that we don't want to have a, uh, an iron fist approach, meaning a command and control approach. I'll talk about that a little bit later in the webinar today when we get into some of the different approaches and how the framework might help you to identify what the best approach is for you. So let's talk about first the customizable data governance framework. And before we, before I show it to you, I want you to know a few things about it. So this is really a generic approach 
a, a generic framework that you can use to insert any approach to data governance. It includes what I consider to be the core components, the main elements of a data governance program that you need to concern yourself with. You know, looking at the organizational levels from the executive level all the way down to the operational and support levels. I'm going to share with you, like I said, a blank framework, but then I'm also going to share with you one that's filled in with information that would be more likely to be used for an organization that's taking a non-invasive approach. And then last, I'm going to show you a comparison version where we can take the different components of the framework and look at them from several different approaches. And last to, to talk about it, the, uh, with the framework is the inspiration for the framework. And some of you may be familiar with the Zachrin framework for enterprise architecture. It's a very popular framework that's been around for a long time. It really, what it does is it describes the who, what, why, why, when, where, and how of the organization from a bunch of different perspectives. And what I've done is I've taken what John Zachman has done and I've molded it into a framework for data governance. And that is what you see on the screen now. And so with this framework, basically it's the matrix kind of similar to what John had put in the Zachman framework, but I define the core components of the program across the top. And that's the data, the roles, the processes, communications, metrics, and tools. If you've seen this framework before, I didn't have a data column. So we really need to talk about what specific data is it that we're going to govern. And that's why I've added that as a core component of the program. Again, looking at it from the executive all the way down to the support perspectives of the organization. This is a blank matrix. And if you can't read what's in the upper left, I wanted to make that a little bit more readable to you. So the date, by the data, we're talking about the assets that are being governed. The roles, you know, basically who's going to be held formally accountable for what in the, in the processes of data governance. We'll talk about the processes, the communications, metrics, and tools. And then I identify the five different, at least what I consider to be the five different levels of a typical organization, which is the executive piece of the organization, the strategic piece, tactical, operational, and then all of those different functions within the organization that support the program. So we've got the support function as well. So this is the empty framework. Let me show you here real quickly at least what the completed framework looks like in terms of non-invasive data governance. So if you look at, at the top where it says non-invasive data governance framework, it said just data governance framework on the prior slide because like I said before, you can customize the framework to what makes sense for your organization. And so um, I'm gonna walk through uh, each of the pieces across the top, each of the pieces down the side, and then we'll get into the details of looking at data from the executive perspective, from the strategic, tactical, operational, and support perspective. So it's a very simple um, five by six matrix, again, with the, uh, the core components, and you may have different components, but these are the ones that I've experienced in my practice. Um, so these are the core components that we're going to discuss. And then, like I said, you may have a different organizational structure where you might not have as many levels or you may have more levels, um, but you want to make certain that you're addressing each and every one of the different perspectives of people within the uh, organization. So let's start out by talking about those six core components. And what I do is I have a smaller version of the, the framework in front of you, and I'm going to highlight in yellow. I'm going to do this kind of throughout the presentation as to the part of the framework that I'm speaking about. So when I said roles, processes, a role, um, data, roles, processes, communications, metrics, and tools, that's the top part of the matrix. And as you can look underneath them and just kind of sneak a peek, if you look under roles from an, elite, an executive strategic tactical, it has an, a, a name of a typical type of position that might be assumed by somebody at that level of the organization. That's just as an example. And then from processes, and you're looking at it from each of the different perspectives. So Let's first walk through the different components of a data governance framework. And the first one, and the one that's been added since the older version from several years ago of the non-invasive data governance framework, is the data piece. And basically, the scope of the resources um, that are being governed within your, your program is really what the data column is all about. Are we looking at just data? Are we looking at information, records, knowledge? What are the specific types of data that we're looking at within the organization. 
Some organizations call the program information governance and some call it data governance. Others have called, uh, have called it records management or records and information management. So one of the things that you want to identify first is what is the scope of the data resources that we are looking at and what do we call these things? Is there an understanding as to what the difference is between data and information and information and content and things like that? So we need to be very clear in that definition as we're getting started. In the non-invasive approach to governance, you know, it's very similar. Uh, you have a very similar approach. In fact, most of the components of this program will work for any type of data that you're going to be looking at. So whether it's structured data, unstructured data, content, records management, um, you're going to need some of those same core components when you're addressing the governance of those resources. So the program's going to look somewhat similar depending on the, the type of resource that it is that you are attempting to govern with your program. The second core component, it's one that I talk about all the time. In fact, the last, uh, last month's webinar with Dataversity um, shared a complete set of data governance roles and responsibilities. And my suggestion is that you know, the way that you go identifying the roles for your program can be a real predictor of the effort that's going to be required to govern the data within your organization. As I said before, I'm often known to say that everybody in the organization potentially is a data steward. And that's going to need to, that's going to really dictate how the program is going to move forward as compared to if you're going to only have a handful of people that you identify as data stewards. You know, the idea that everybody is a data steward, if you use data, you got to use it effectively. You got to use it the right way. If you define data, you've got to catalog all the information about the data in your repository, and you got to have clear definition to the data. So really the roles are based on people's relationship to the data. And it'll also help to dictate how many people in the organization are going to need to be involved. I mean, you may need to communicate to a wide uh, stretch of people across your organization if you're considering that everybody in the organization is potentially a data steward. And I uh, spent in the, in the webinar last month, I talked about an operating model of roles and responsibilities. And the idea is to put together a detailed document that says what people are going to do as part of the program all the way from the executive steering committee level, all the way down to the operational data stewards that are defining, producing, and using data as part of their job. You also need to define what role IT plays. So all of these different components fit into the roles and responsibilities. That's going to be one of the first questions that you get is, you know, who does what? When do they get involved? How do they get involved? You know, I suggested right here that there are several things that you want to include within that operating model, which is a description of their responsibilities, typically bulleted out, you know, who's going to participate in each role and how much of their time is going to be necessary. You know, all of these things that people are going to ask when you're going to ask them to get involved or you're going to go to them and say, hey, you're a steward of the data. We're expecting you to do steward stuff. Well, they're going to want to know what that means and how you went about um, recognizing them as being data stewards in the organization. The third core component, or the third foundational component, is the processes. So it's real good if you can define what data you're going to govern, and it's really good if you can go and define the roles and responsibilities. But if we can't apply them to something and we can't engage people in process, then we're not going to have a successful program. And at the beginning of the, the webinar, I stated that the non-invasive approach really talks about how we're applying governance to process. Rather than redefining all of your processes or having a single data governance process, my suggestion is that you take a look at the steps of your process and you get the right people involved at the right time for the right reason. I typically call that a data governance bill of rights, you know, doing the right thing at the right time. Um, and in non-invasive data governance, we're looking to take processes and make them repeatable, have a good cross-reference of who does what during the steps of the process and what the outcome is going to be of those steps of the process. So processes are certainly an extremely important part. You know, a lot of people talk about people and process, or they talk about data and process and technology. Well, processes seem to be at the heart of what almost everybody is thinking about when it comes to implementing governance programs. Communications. We've done webinars in the past on putting together a communication plan. And my suggestion is that communications is a huge part 
of a successful data governance program and therefore needs to be a huge part of the data governance framework. How we're going to communicate with the different people in the organization at the different levels needs to be spelled out. We're certainly not going to communicate with the operational data stewards the same way that we're going to communicate with the executive branch of the organization. So we need to make certain that we spell out a communication plan, understanding what we're going to share with people and how it's going to be shared, understanding that it may really depend on the audience that you're communicating with. So really, every aspect of the program has to be communicated, and typically I break that down into um, orientation communication, onboarding communication, and ongoing communication. So certainly we need to make certain that we keep people involved. We help to orient them to the idea of data governance. We onboard them when it gets to the point where they need to be actively involved. And then we have ongoing communications, which might be closely related to the metrics and the measurements that you use to demonstrate the value of your program. And that just so happens to be the next component of the, of the, uh, of the framework is the metrics. We know that we need to be able to demonstrate value. Sometimes it can be tangible financial value, a quantified financial value. Sometimes it just increases in efficiency and effectiveness. And sometimes we can build on those things by, um, by building governance into the processes and taking benchmarks early on to understand how long does it take us to do something now and how long does it take us some point in the future, we can actually measure what data governance is doing for the organization and what value it is adding to the organization. So metrics are another component of a, a successful data governance framework. And the last component is tools. We all know that tools are important. I'm sure Danny will admit that tools are, are very important to successful data governance programs. There's a lot of different tools and templates that I share over time, but they really become the enabler to your program and to help you to deliver value to the organization. So tools are used to, to help to manage the data, manage the metadata or the information about the data, improve knowledge about the data, about, uh, improve knowledge about the, the data and the rules and the processes so that um, Joe user understands what the rule is about using certain data certain ways and that he can refer to that rule very quickly. The, the, the tools are very important for the success of the program. And we're going to look at those from each of the different perspectives as well. Now let's talk about the five different perspectives that we need to look at this from. And I call them the five different levels of the organization. And typically, if you think about your own organization, you've got an executive level, potentially a strategic level, tactical, operational. And then there's a lot of supporting functions in your organization things that might already be considered data governance, you know, IT security, audit, um, human resources, even maybe some level of, of support for your program. So we need to understand where, uh, you know, who participates in each of these different levels, how they get involved. And I'll share with you a quick diagram of what the operating model of roles and responsibilities looks like, the one that I spoke about in last month's webinar, but we're not going to go into a lot of detail about that. But what we want to do is recognize where roles play and fit into the framework that I'm sharing with you. So let's run down the levels real quickly. So then we'll start getting into the meat of the framework, which is where the rows meet the columns. And there's a lot of information to provide there. So there's the enterprise perspective, which often is referred to as the C-level. And I think we have almost a, a, a C-level position for every letter in the alphabet. A CAO, a CBO, a CIO, a C, um, there's a lot of different executives, but we know that if our, our data governance program is going to be successful, that we're going to need to have support and sponsorship from people at this level of the organization. So we need to define, uh, you know, from an enterprise perspective, what, uh, what do we know about what data do they care about? What role are they going to play? What processes do they get involved in if they're going to get involved? You know, communications, all of those things. We've got to look at all of those different components of the program by each of the levels. So we're, the first level is that executive, is that top tier of people within your organization. The strategic level, a lot of your organizations might have roles that you call a data governance council or a data governance committee or something named like that. Typically, that's the top 
strategic part of the organization. Uh, and we need to, again, look at the, the components of our data governance program from the perspective of the, the people that are playing a strategic role in the organization. So we've got executive, we've got strategic. Perhaps one of the most important pieces of a data governance program um, is the tactical level. I often refer to those people as data domain stewards, or I refer to them as, as subject matter experts for the data. Now, these are people that have a tactical responsibility for governance, and they're looking at the data, they're looking at the roles, they're looking at the communications and processes, tools and metrics, they're looking at them from the cross-business unit eye. You know, typically, I talk about the, the tactical level being where we break down the silos, where we have people that have responsibility for data across business areas rather than specifically within their individual business area. So we'll talk a little bit about how the tactical, uh, um, the, the tactical level of the organization uh, pertains to each of the different components that I've walked through so far. And then we've got the operational level, and those are the people in the organization typically in the daily are defining, producing, and using data as part of their job. They typically consist of almost everybody in the organization, and a lot of those people have relationships to the data. But we need to look at the data and the roles and all of those components from the perspective of these people at the operational level, because they may not look at it exactly the same as the tactical, strategic, or executive levels of the organization. And the last level I want to share with you is the support level, and that's the one that's most vague out of all the, the different levels, because those are parts of the organization or the people in the organization that are there to help you to execute and enforce authority. And that may be, as I mentioned before, the IT part of the organization might be a support part of the organization. Well, we certainly need to look at the framework from their perspective. And IT security, we need to look at it from their perspective. So levels is the final perspective or the final level of the framework that we're going to look at each of those components by each of those levels. And so we'll talk about the support level as well. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is the detailed description of where each row meets every column. So we want to look at um, we want to look at the the data from the executive perspective and the data from the strategic and the same with the roles and the processes. So we're going to look at the meat of this diagram and we're going to go through each of those relatively quickly because we only have a limited amount of time today. If you're interested in more information about the framework. I'm going to share with Shannon a, a white paper that describes the whole white, uh, the whole framework in more detail, from the empty um, empty framework to the one that's filled in. But I'm going to go through these relatively quickly because I think it's important that we at least discuss them and touch on them. When you're thinking about building a framework for your organization, you don't necessarily need to use the things that I'm implying that you would use it within the framework but you really want to define it at, from the perspectives of these people within your organization. So when we talk about data by the different levels, well, oftentimes the people at the executive level are most uh, interested in the data that's going to help them to effectively lead the organization. And a lot of that information comes to them in their KPIs and their dashboards, but they certainly have a perspective. They're not necessarily looking at the data from the operational perspective or even really understanding that we have multiple definitions of the data and the data is used different ways in parts of the organization. Of course they care about that, but the things that they care most about are the data that they need to help them to effectively lead the organization. From the strategic level, you know, they're looking at it as an enterprise asset and they're looking at it as, as a, an asset that's going to help us to improve performance within our organization. At the tactical level, as I mentioned before, those are the people that are now looking at the data from a cross-business unit, from a subject area perspective, rather than um, a siloed business unit by business unit perspective. At the operational level, they're looking at the data that they need to use to do their job within their business unit to serve their function of the organization. So they're certainly going to look at the data a little bit differently than the folks at a tactical level or strategic or executive level. And then the data from the support level, you know, they're most concerned with accountability and making certain that we've inventoried all the data and metadata. 
one of the main assets that help us to add context to the data so we can turn it into information, that's some of the data that the people at the support level are looking at. So let's jump into the roles. And this one's probably the easiest one to describe. And I'm sharing with you a very small version of the operating model. But like I said, the, uh, the webinar last month goes into every level and every detail of, of all the different roles and responsibilities. So you may want to take a look at that. But at the executive level, when it comes to the roles of the program, that's going to be your leadership. That's going to be your steering committee. That's going to be the people in the organization that say that data governance is important enough that we're going to apply resources to it and that we're going to focus on improving the value of data to the organization. At the strategic level, they're the ones that typically kind of preside over the program. And they're the ones that have responsibility for making certain that the different parts of the program are in place. This is the group that most often the people that are administering the data governance program go to. They go to the council to share with them the status of the program, things that are being worked on, to get some level of priority as to what needs to be worked on first, second, and third. Um, the tactical level of the organization, that's those data domain stewards, the subject matter experts. A lot of people refer to them as data owners. Take a look in the, uh, the most recent issue of, of TDAM.com. There's an article that I wrote about the difference between owners and stewards and when we should use each of the different words to describe the people in the organization. I try to shy away from the use of the term data owner because it implies some things that I don't think we really want to imply that these people own the data when the organization is really, when the data is really owned by the organization. At the operational level, we've got the operational folks like the data stewards, the people that we refer to as users of data. From the support level, we've got people that have responsibility for managing the program, whether it's your data governance office, team, administrator. Um, you've got work groups that you put together to solve problems, and then you've got partners of the data governance team or the data governance office, and that can be, as I said before, IT security, IT, audit, legal, HR, all of those are potential partners of the data governance program. So when we look at the roles, we want to make certain that we're addressing each and every one of the levels that we've defined in the framework. When it comes to the processes, there are certain processes that different people in the organization at different levels have, um, have as their focus. You know, at the executive level, they want, we want them to endorse and enforce the program. We want them to authorize the program. We want them to act on things that we have uncovered as part of the program. At the strategic level, they're really directing and approving and prioritizing and resolving issues that get escalated up to the strategic level. At the tactical level, what's their responsibility to processes? They're there to facilitate and mediate and promote effective practices within the organization. At the operational level, these are the people, again, that day to day are managing the data, are handling the data, that really need to understand the rules associated with the data in order for us to successfully govern data across the board. And then from the support perspective, these are the folks that help us to formalize, adhere, and enforce different roles, uh, rules, or ULES, that they, um, that they are um, implementing within the organization to make certain that we, as an organization, are, are complying, that we're uh, securing and, and making private the data the way that we need to. So when it comes to the, the processes, we can look at them from all five levels as well. And I've given you some of the ideas, some verbs to help you to understand what are some of the processes that people at these levels are most concerned with. When it comes to communication, this is really important as well. I mean, we want the executive level, they need to support, sponsor, and understand what we're doing with our data governance program. If they don't, and I've mentioned this when I've talked about best practices before, it's immediate risk for the organization if the people at the highest level of the organization don't support, sponsor, and most importantly, understand what you're doing with your data governance program. At the strategic level, we need to provide status to them. They're evaluating the program. They have the responsibility of also commending those people within the organization that are doing what they're, what's being asked and, and help people to understand that there is somebody that's noticing that they're becoming effective data managers within their parts of the organization. At the tactical level, most of the communication res resolves or revolves around standards and 
subject areas and different projects that are going on. For example, if you're focusing on customer data, that might be the subject area that, that you have projects going on. You may be um, creating a master data solution for your customer or for your product or for your vendor or material, whatever those subject matters are, um, that's where we need to help, uh, we need to work with the people at the tactical level and communicate effectively to the organization information that's going to help people to understand data within their subject area, make the best use of the data within that subject area, and also protect and, and, and make certain that we're keeping private the data the way that it needs to, again, within that subject area. At the operational level, well, as I mentioned before, we need to make certain that we're orienting people across the organization to data governance and helping them to understand what it is. When they need to get involved, we're going to onboard them. So we might have additional communications for these folks to let them know what their role is in the program and what types of activities they're going to get involved in and when they should look to get involved in the program. So we need to orient them to data governance in general, bring them on board, but then we also need to be able to provide ongoing communication to them. How effective have we been? Uh, are we measuring the appropriate things? How do we know when something should instigate data governance to get active and get going, get involved? And those things are ongoing types of communication that we're going to provide to basically everybody within the organization. And from the support level, um, we want to make sure that we're working with them to communicate how this is planned, how it's being developed, and how it's being delivered to the organization. So again, take a look at the communications, which is one of the core components, and think about how we need to communicate to the different people across the organization and what they're interested in so we can make certain that we hit the mark on providing them the information that they need. Um, the metrics by level, so typically the executives need to approve the metrics that we're going to uh, share with the organization, but even more importantly than that, they need to act on the results. Um, in the earlier version of the framework, I didn't have the word act in there, because, and that's been pointed out to me by several people that, you know, why are we doing these things? At some point, somebody needs to approve that change is going to take place. They need to act on the results that are being brought to the council and then being brought by the council to the executive level of the organization. At the strategic level, they're looking for acceptance, participation, performance metrics. At the tactical level, it's mostly focused on those specific subject areas that the people at the tactical level are most interested in. At the operational level, we can measure accountability and efficiency and effectiveness, as I mentioned before. And at the support level, we need somebody to help us to make certain that we're collecting and that we're reporting the appropriate metrics across the organization. Again, the metrics are another one of those core pieces, that uh, components of a successful program. And the last one is the tools. And there's different tools that are being used by people at different levels of the organization. So at the executive level, we don't expect them to, um, to jump into our data modeling tools and to jump into our repository tools. But the tools that they're most concerned with are the policies and the directives and the audits that are taking place across the organization. At the strategic level, again, these people might not necessarily be as hands-on, and some of the tools we might want to consider for them are the charter for the program, or the best practices, the guidelines, and the roadmap of the next steps that we're taking. Like I mentioned before, at the strategic level, that role has the responsibility for approving things and prioritizing things moving forward. At, this, at the tactical level, they're worried about the tools that will help them to document standards, document requirements and workflows. At the operational level, we've got a lot of the tools. Some of the things that Danny spoke about, which were the glossary and the dictionary and the catalog and the repository, Typically, that information is going to primarily come from the operational level of the organization. From the support perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we're talking about the data governance tools, tools like Irwin that would help you to catalog and to record all of that information that's going to be of value to people in the organization. So those metadata tools, all of those artifacts that I tend to share with you throughout the different webinars that I give, I consider those to be tools as well because there are ways to help to get you jump-started in collecting the appropriate information within your organization that will support your data governance program. 
So basically, we talked about the levels. We talked about the core components. We talked about the, the core components by each of the different levels. The last thing that I want to share with you today before we turn it back over to Shannon is uh, a way to use a framework like this to compare the different approaches to data governance and to help you to identify which one's most appropriate for your organization. So the names that I give to the different approaches that I often talk about are the command and control approach. It's top down, it's you will do this. The traditional approach, which I liken to the, the movie, The Field of Dreams, which is if you build it, they will come. So it's gonna be certainly a responsive action of people to get them involved uh, in the program if you take kind of that traditional approach. In the non-invasive approach, we're really looking at it as the fact that a lot of these people are already doing these things and that we're gonna help them to do them more efficiently and more effectively by putting more formal accountability around the things that they do. So these are the three primary approaches and this is the comparison um, matrix that I have put together. So if you look at this matrix, what I've done is I've taken the, what was across the top of the previous framework and I've put them down the, the, the left-hand side of the matrix where you have the data down through the tools. And across the top now, what I've listed is command and control, traditional, and the non-invasive approaches. So we want to look at each of the different core components according to each of the different approaches that organizations are using for data governance. And so this, I just wanted to blow up, it was in the upper left-hand corner so you can see it better. You know, typically the command and control approach really has limited coverage within the organization because you're identifying that handful of people with accountability for the data. The traditional approach, as I said before, it really depends on how people respond and how they want to be engaged. In the non-invasive approach, if you're looking at everybody being potentially a data steward, you have complete coverage of the organization. That might require additional communication because you're talking about communicating with a lot more people, but we know that we need to uh, make certain that anybody who has responsibility around data understands what their responsibility is, what the program is, and how the program can help them to improve the quality, the value, the protection of data within the organization. So let's go through each of the different, um, each of the different components that I mentioned from each of the different perspectives. And so from a data perspective and the command and control approach, organizations oftentimes just talk about governing the data. And it doesn't necessarily go to a much deeper definition than that. Typically, what I see in a traditional approach is that they go a little bit further than just say, oh, we're gonna govern the data of the organization. And they say, it's gonna be the data. It's gonna be the metadata that's gonna add context to the data to turn it into information. In the non-invasive approach, typically you can be looking at any type of data or information resource within the organization, from data to information to records management to knowledge management and such. So there is a difference between what the focus is on data according to the different approach that you're going to take to implement governance in your organization. When we look at the different approaches by roles, um, there's a big difference. In command and control approach, people are assigned into roles. Rather than being identified that, you know, this is a role that we would like you to play or being recognized and saying that somebody does something with data, so therefore we're going to help them to understand how to do that thing better. So it's a much more aggressive, it's much more invasive to assign people into roles. It's less invasive, but still somewhat invasive to identify people into roles. But if you're going to recognize people into roles based on their existing relationship to the data, that's really what non-invasive data governance is all about. We're, not, we're going to try not to give people more than what they already have, but understand that we may help them to do some of the things they've been doing in the past um, a bit better, or should I say, at least a bit more formally. From, a, from the processes perspective, the command and control approach, typically people look at things as being new processes. Or in a traditional approach, oftentimes I hear people refer to something as the data governance process, as if data governance can be a single process. Typically in non-invasive governance, in non-invasive data governance, we're looking at the process that, uh, that we have and we're applying the roles and responsibilities to that process. Like I said before, the Bill of Rights, getting the right people involved at the right time for the right reason to get you to the right solution, at least most of the time. 
communications is very different as well. In the command and control approach, we're going to um, we're going to tell people that they are going to do this. You will do this versus you should do this. In the non-invasive approach, saying you know what you're already doing this. Let us help you to figure out ways to do this more effectively for the organization. From the metrics, they measure different things as well. Typically, in the command and control approach, they're looking for measurement of return on investment versus data quality, which is really the traditional approach to metrics within a data governance program. In a non-invasive approach, we're going to focus on the advancement of the program, meaning how well has this been accepted into the organization? How many issues has it solved? We can get to the point by saying, you know, how have these issues um, related to or translated into dollars and cents. Um, so understand that the metrics component can be looked at in different ways from the different levels of the organization that we spoke about before, but also in the different levels of approaches that organizations are taken. Metrics may be viewed a little bit differently depending on the approach. In the command and control approach with tools, a lot of organizations will buy the tool first and try to fit their program into the tool versus um, the traditional approach is let's look at what we have in the organization and let's leverage it wherever we can. Um, and then the non-invasive approach is we're going to leverage what we have, we're going to build tools, we're going to apply purchase tools to our solution, but we're not going to limit it to one type of tool. We're going to look at what we can build versus what we can buy versus what we already have in the organization to identify those specific tools that are going to add value to our data governance initiative. So just kind of going back to the beginning, I, I want to go back and just kind of share the blank matrix with you because all of the things that I've shared with you, all of the nouns and all of the verbs that fill in each of these different blocks, are, they came from me. They came from the idea of being non-invasive in your approach, but you may not be calling your approach non-invasive data governance. So my suggestion is you might want to start with an empty template like this one and work in and start filling in, well, how are, are the strategic people viewing the roles? Or what is the strategic role for data governance in the organization? Or at the operational level, how are we going to communicate with those folks? And if you can answer what you're doing in each of these empty blocks in this uh, framework, you'll be well on your way to putting together all of the, uh, the necessary components for implementing governance within your organization. So today in the webinar, I know I ran through it kind of quickly for you. I shared with you that customizable data governance framework. We talked about the six core components of the framework being the data, the roles, the processes, communication, tools, and, and metrics. And then the five perspectives being executive, strategic, tactical, operational, and support. And we use the framework to kind of look at it from the perspective of the different approaches that organizations are using for data governance. So that's what I walked through today. As Shannon mentioned, I'm, I've blocked off some time after the webinar to go to the, I'm sorry, the, the, the Dataversity community. Uh, we go to community.dataversity.net, and I'll be there to answer questions or to chat with you if you have questions or comments about anything that I've shared with you today. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon to see if we have any questions today. Hi, Bob. Thank you so much, as always, for this great presentation. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording and anything else requested. We do have, um, we do often send the matrices from Bob on those follow-up emails. Uh, so diving in here, um, so to both you, Bob and Danny, um, uh, this is a large task that is spread over various IT organizations. So who's the right owner to establish and run this? Danny, do you want to take that first or should I take a stab at it? Yeah, that's a that's a tough question. I think I, I think I'm gonna listen to what you have to say. <laughs> well, typically there's not one place they should reside in every organization. Every organization is different. Some people tell you that if your data governance program resides in IT, it's going to fail. I'm not one of those that will tell you that. It really depends on the purpose and the scope and the expectations that you're setting for data governance. So if you're setting it up as a program to affect primarily IT-related things, that's where people are going to think it should reside. Most people will answer the question of where it should reside in IT or a business. They'll answer the question very quickly, um, business. 
But the question is, what part of the business should it reside in? And so there's often, it could be in an institutional research part of the organization. It could be in a credit risk part of the organization or a shared services part of the organization. So there's not really one single answer as to where governance programs should reside. I don't know, Danny, you have any different take on that than I did? No, I think I think you, you nailed it. It, it. What I've seen in in dealing with some of our customers, it's 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 where is the pain, um, and and it generally starts there. But that's by no means the place that it that it ends up at the end of the journey. So um, you know, if as you say, it might be in a, a credit risk. You know, there, there's a lot of different, depending on the the line of business or the type of business that you're in. Uh, you know, my answer to the is it IT or business. I always say both, um, which is not really an answer because it doesn't give you a, a single throat to choke, but I don't think that that's really what we're looking for. So, uh, but, but yeah, I, I generally, I've seen it where, where there's, you know, a good sponsorship and a council at the, at the higher level. And then they, they, they sort of cross those business lines and everybody kind of gets on board because they've seen that, or it's, it's the line of business that's leveraging data, taking the biggest risks with data or feeling the greatest pain with data where it starts. And then they start to, uh, you know, expand that out across as other people see all the goodness that comes with it. Yeah. And I'm very similar to what you answered. When people ask me if it should reside in it or in business, my answer is yes, it needs to reside somewhere and somebody has to have responsibility. But if it's going to be in IT, make certain that there's heavy business involvement because it's not typically in IT for IT's sake. We're really trying to solve the business's problem with the data, and IT is really the, the conduit to get it there. So how would you apply this framework in a less mature organization? Um, you know what, the, what I would do is I would look first to see what already exists. So a lot of organizations will tell you that they're not very mature with data governance to start. But if you say to them, well, do you have an executive level of the organization? Okay, yes, they do. Okay, well, that's a start. Do you have a strategic level of the organization? Well, maybe you have something that you can leverage to be a strategic um, part of the uh, governance roles and responsibilities. You know, my suggestion is, Take a look at what you already have. What are some of the existing practices within some of these support areas of the organization that have a governance component to it? So look for things that are governance-like if you're starting out with a very immature organization, and you might find that you're more mature than you actually think you are. Danny, any insights that you want to add there? No, you know, I, I've, I've seen a lot, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's again, where's the pain point and where, where do you have some maturity that you can leverage? Um, and, and, you know, if you're starting at the, at the bottom level, at the support and, and the, the um, uh, below the tactical, I can't remember the framework now, <laughs> uh, you know, that's great. You can start to solve some pains and put some pieces in place. Uh, and then, you know, do the evangelizing up at the top um, and, and then start to, to leverage that to get the, the shoulder behind it that you're going to need eventually when when either money runs out or, or you know, somebody decides it's not a good idea. So if you take an empty framework and you just put a check in the block, in the box where the row meets the column and recognize that there's a need there, I think that's one way, again, to, you might find that you have a lot of empty blocks if you're really immature. Um, but it will at least give you a starting point and give you some things that you can work on to improve your levels of maturity. Love it. And we don't have a ton of time left, but I think we have time for one more question. But do keep the questions coming because uh, in the follow-up email, I will we'll include the answers and Bob will write up the answers to any questions that are outstanding. So uh, any tips on which of the six core components to start with first or prioritize higher? Well, my suggestion is to start with the data and the roles columns first, because you want to know what data resource it is that you're going to govern, whether it's going to be structured data or unstructured data or records management or content or whatever knowledge management, anything that you're looking to govern. So we've got to start with the, the data column, but I'd say look at the roles column first. 
because that's really the backbone. If you noticed all the, I know that the templates that I shared in this webinar were very small, but there was an, a role component to each of those. In the um, RACI matrix, the roles are being cross-referenced with the steps of a process. In a communication plan, the roles are being, are being cross-referenced with the types of communication that we're providing. So my suggestion, uh, Danny, I don't know if you have a, a, another suggestion, maybe you're suggesting another, uh, um, another component, but I would say start with the data and the roles, and that will set you in a good course of motion for your program. Bob, as usual, we're in violent agreement. Um, uh, you know, the data, if you don't have your, if you don't start getting your arms around the data as to what is, is critical and what's important, what's first, um, you know, you're going to have some challenges, but many hands make light work. And if you can start to, to put people and get them to accept that responsibility and give them the accountability and the, and the power, then they can start to do some of the other call or, or, uh, uh, columns across, uh, in terms of, of doing the investigation and bringing in the right people that can help with that. But if you try to do it all and then have a finished thing to give to somebody, uh, you know, that that's going to be a challenge. So uh, I, I would agree with you. It's, it's data then roles. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you both again for this great presentations and for the time. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything that we do. We love all the chat and the Q&A coming in. Again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording, the matrices, et cetera, from this presentation, as well as answers to questions that we haven't had time to get to. And again, if you'd like to continue the conversation and continue to chat with Bob, you can do so at uh, in the Dataversity community at community.dataversity.net. And thanks to Erwin for the sponsorship today. We appreciate it as always. Thanks, everybody. Hope you all have a great day. Have a great day. Thanks to you all. Thanks, Bob.